Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. I'm adjusting my chair. Because I'm professional. And <clears throat> I'm also timely. Back to been timely since this time last year. And the time has come to talk about the Nintendo press conferences. Because, as I mentioned in the last video, Nintendo's press briefing was Tuesday morning. They my went to watch it, watch it, I thought, oh, okay, we're going to get our Wii U coverage, get our 3DS coverage, all that fun stuff. No! They decided to split it up. They gave us a brief teaser of a 3DS press briefing, which they said would be Wednesday night, and then went into, um, well, just talking about Wii U stuff. And so, like, well, this is breaking it all down told this joke already, but a good joke bears repeating. This is breaking it all down. Not breaking it half down, making half down down half later, unless of course I'm trying to avoid spoilers. So, I'm going to wait and put it off until Thursday. Watch the uh, 3DS press briefing on, win on Wednesday night and then put it all together on Thursday during the daylight because as you all saw, Recording in the evening, even with the use of other light sources, no matter how flickery they are, and po and possibly seizure-inducing if I had it on camera, and yeah, that didn't work because of maintenance never works in real life. Um, so no matter how hard I tried, I, anyway, if I record, record in the evening, it would look crappy. So I record it Thursday morning. Thus, here I am. Thursday afternoon, here I am. Whatever. It's Thursday, you're getting it on time. Be happy. Stop complaining. Would you like some cheese with that wine? <clears throat> anyway, so let's start off with the Tuesday press briefing. We get a reveal trailer of Pikmin 3 at the end, at the beginning, and like, ah, this is good. Shigeru Miyamoto comes out and shows off the game. It looks great. Seriously, it looks great. Um, the game... I mean, it's a real-time strategy game. All the Pikmin games have. But this game, by giving you multiple playable leaders at one time, you can bounce between, and using the Wii U's touchscreen as a mini-map, then you scroll around the map faster, it, 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 looks, it looks really good. It reminds me of, back in the day, you'd have people trying to put real-time strategy games on consoles. We had console versions of Command & Conquer, and StarCraft, and Red Alert, and, and all this other stuff. I mean, actually, you can, you can find the Command and Con the uh, PlayStation version of Command and Conquer Red Alert in the PlayStation Store if you really want to give it a try. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. And the reason all these things worked is because you couldn't multitask your units very well, and in particular, the key to really doing well at an RTS uh, aside from all the other stuff with the, with the micro versus macro game, when you, when you shuffle all of that aside, it is managing your information and managing your screen very quickly, and getting between your different bases on the map using by using your your sub screen to get there get from point A to point B very quickly. And the Wii U controller with the touch screen looks like it can handle that mini map much much better. Let you jump around as you, as you need to much better. I mean, you, you theoretically could have gotten some of that with just the Wii, particularly with Wii Motion Plus, where you have your on-screen cursor as being like your mouse, you would have your sidebar, which has your unit selection and your mini-map up here. Uh, you'd use your Wii Mote to click and drag to select units, and then, I don't know how you'd handle hotkeying. Um, and then going to the mini-map by putting the Wiimote up at the corner and then clicking there or whatever to bounce around the, the mini-map as necessary. Here, using the Wii U, you can just tap that 
to jump around the map more easily, or possibly even to handle more long-term movement instructions. And that's good! I like it! More people need to do this. Um, actually, the, this opening to this presentation, just the opening before a bunch of later stuff, made me... It made me feel bad for having not owned a Nintendo system for like an actual physical console post NES or technically SNES because I have a retro clone. But you know what I mean. I haven't owned a Nintendo console when it was a lot when it was active and actively supported since the NES. And then things start going downhill. Get really go downhill. I this is iced tea. I wish this was whiskey, or scotch, or something harder. At least during the press conference, I wish I had something harder. So we get Reggie. Um, he says we're going to get 23 new titles he's going to show off here. That is a lie. That is a blatant lie. That is so much of a blatant lie that... If I was writing a, if I was stuck writing a, doing a write-up of this for a new site, if I thought I'd get away with it, I would highlight the words "23 new titles," open up a new tab, and put a link in there to the blatant lies page on TV tropes. That's how bad it is, because we don't. Um. Unless you're counting stuff that we see very, very briefly in montages or individual games in a mini game collection, we did not see those 23 new games in this briefing. Or alternatively, if by saying you'll see 23 new games, he meant at the booth instead of the presentation, in which case he wasn't being clear. But in any case, Reggie failed to communicate well here and possibly even, again, lied in the presentation. So, um, 23 new titles, we use getting YouTube and Amazon Instant support. Uh, the YouTube app can't possibly be worse than the, than the Xbox 360 app. It would be hard. If they managed to make it worse, I'd be impressed in a sarcastic, oh my god, how did you fail so hard way, but I would be impressed. Um, also, we, we get that the Wii U will support two of the Wii U big honking gamepad things instead of just one, which is nice. Um, before we heard that it would only support one, so getting two in there is good. That actually worked really well for, they're talking about using one of the big things for this was Madden play calling when you're playing a... a one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, couch multiplayer. Don't have to worry about somebody seeing which plays you're calling, so that's good. I like it. I like it. It's good. Way to go. Um, you look at the new interface, sort of. It looks obfuscated. It has, like, various little gem-type icons there with a whole bunch of me's underneath them. Suppose from your friends and so forth, showing, okay, what's popular, or that sort of thing. Kind of meant to be a social networking thing, but I'm not sure how it would work in practice, and we don't see them actually using the menu. Maybe if we get an actual video of them using the menu, it would make more sense, but not with what we have here. Um, new Super Mario Brothers U. Uh, it looks fun. Um, I don't know if this was in the um, last new... Um, if this is a new Super Mario Brothers Wii. But either in addition to the multitude of hats and different like elemental flowers and fire flowers like an ice flower and that sort of thing, we have different baby Yoshis that you can carry around with different abilities. Like they can shoot up but like one can shoot bubbles which traps enemies in them and turns them into coins. One has uh, like a flight ability. Um, several other sorts of things. Or like a yeah, it's it's flight ability. It's meant to be like hovering, but it's like floating like a balloon. But it's flight ability. And it looks interesting, and it adds another level of gameplay. If they keep the hats and they keep the and they combine that with the baby Yoshi's, that could be fun. Um, we use getting a new version of Batman Arkham City. Looks pretty much the same. It has a new item called um, basically it's power up ability. 
that you get, and they've moved a lot of subscreen stuff to the menu, which is fine. Actually, and th that's the trend we get here is moving sub moving stuff that would be a pause menu to us to the we most we use subscreen, and I like that. That works well. Um, I think that that could be a good way to, to make some of that stuff more manageable. Um, I'm going to be unprofessional and blow my news. So give me a second while I pause. And I'm back. Not a jarring edit at all. Um, so I like the DVD and the subscreen stuff there. If we actually the game which I think would benefit from this the most, which we didn't see in any of the montage trailers, would be Skyrim. Or whatever the next Elder Scrolls game is. And, I mean, the Wii U looks like it has the graphical power to run Skyrim. And particularly what makes this stick out to me is, in Skyrim, and all the Elder Scrolls games, there also is a certain degree of you having to bounce through various menus and stuff to manage your inventory, and in particular, looking at maps. Um, I have this problem with dungeons where I'm not quite sure where I'm going, so to keep bouncing back and forth between the main, between the main screen and the map screen. And if I was playing... Skyrim or Elder Scrolls 6 or whatever on the Wii U with the controller, I'd, I'd be nice to be able to go, all right, where am, or am I? Where do I need to be going? And not just be stuck navigating by the little compass thing or having to keep pausing the game. They could just look down at the menu and go, okay, he, all right, here's the dungeon map. I need to be here. So here's what I have to do to get there. That is excellent. This ties into when uh, we first saw the Wii U, one of the things I, li I liked about it, and my dog is barking, but anyway, um, one of the things I liked about it is that there was the potential there to basically go on the route of some of my favorite 3DS, not 3DS, but DS titles, like for example, I'm going to reach over for a second, the Etrian Odyssey series, which I own every title of. If you're not familiar with the games, Etrian Odyssey um, is a dungeon crawler of your wizardry, might and ma classic might and magic um, general vein, where as part of this, you are mapping the dungeon as you go through it. And rather than having to juggle graph paper, rather than having to handle little map spells or whatever to let you view the squares you've already been into, the game has a very well done um, auto map function on the bottom screen of your DS. So as you go through the dungeon, you map your route based on where you've been. You can tell where, and, and so it works great. It works wonderfully. I love it. Um, you can put notes to it to show, okay, this is the this room has a teleporter in it. This room has a resource of some kind in it that this room is safe and you can rest and avoid monsters here wonderful this is best game not the best game ever but this game is possibly one of the best dungeon crawlers ever um, legend of grimrock comes close but i uh, but i kind of like Etrian odyssey a little more um, it still has its weaknesses but i like Etrian odyssey a little more as far as dungeon crawlers go um, and this would work great for that. I would love to see the Wii, or particularly the Wii U, be the second renaissance of the, or be just be the renaissance and rebirth of the dungeon crawler. Old school, classic, hack and slash dungeon crawler. Um, and the Wii U controller really has the potential for that. But I'm digressing. I'm here to talk about what I saw, not what I want to see. In the future, well, I kind of want to see what I want to see. Um, new Scribblenauts games, Scribblenauts Unlimited. Uh, it's Scribblenauts. Now you can create items and set up keywords for them. Like one of the examples they showed in a gameplay demo from Game Trailers was you can add zombie donut, where you take a donut, you customize it however you want. You can add eyes to a mouth to it, make it look kind of splotchy and uh, decomposed, and call it zombie donut. And it'll go around and try to eat people in the world. Um, theoretically, I could design a, I could kind of draw like 
a Tommy gun. And call it a Tommy gun. Presumably, with a little artistic talent, depending and, and depending on the pre-existing parts in the game, you could probably use this to get around some copyright restrictions, like, or like Band Aid. They can't put Band Aid in the game. Band Aid is a cop is a registered trademark of Johnson and Johnson. They have to pay, uh, the developers have to pay the money to use that. But if oh, I decided to spend a little time in the editor and put some stuff together to create a box of bandages or a, a, a box of band-aids or a band-aid then oh I could put that in the game I don't know if you could share it with your friends but I mean it, it, it's nothing unlike what's been done with wrestling games like WWE 12 behind me where most wrestling games will have a massive number of wrestlers from other promotions past and present who are in the game with their actual move list, their real names, and a pretty close approximation to what they look like, and maybe even also their taunts, for you to use. Going, going by WWE 12, for example, if I wanted to spend a little time, I could probably get most of the classic ECW roster, most of Ring of Honor's current roster, and maybe even some of Jakara's roster, and stick them in my game without having to create them myself and have to manage the settings too much. Um... They probably do that for Scribble. Uh, if Scribble Knots has the ability to share created objects, then I'd say the odds are really good. I do will probably find people managing to fit a Gundam in there, or a Transformer, or the Helicarrier, or any number of little copyrighted things like an alien from Aliens, Xenomorph, or whatever in the game. Just saying. Um. Yeah. After this, we get a third-party title montage. There are some new stuff in there. I didn't catch everything because everything was going so fast. The one that got my attention for our third parties go that really interested me was Trine Two, because um, if you remember the Trine series, I mean, I haven't played them. I've seen them gameplay enough that I know kind of how they works. You hate each of each of these different. Busy party of adventurers like the the archer, the warrior, the the wizard, and that sort of thing. And each of them have their own abilities, and you have to use those abilities to navigate platforming puzzles. Um, and I could see some interesting stuff with like the wizard's abilities going off of the touch screen on the Wii U. So this could be fun. Let's see how this goes. Um. There's a uh, music game titled S Sing coming out. We see no gameplay, so I have no idea what that is. Um, aside from there's singing involved, I would think. There's a new Wii Fit game. Surprise, surprise. Who'd have thunk it? Um, briefly, we get a bit of 3DS stuff. Most of the stuff there we see at the next press conference plus more. In particular, we get a trailer for um, Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, which is the new Luigi's Mansion game. Multiple mansions, different light beams um, for exploration, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, there's a Lego open world game coming for the Wii U called Lego City. The Lego guys talk now. I'm not sure what I think about that. Part of what I liked about the Lego games, uh, aside from just fun of, of destroying stuff and building new stuff is I like the idea of um and all the cutscenes to a certain extent they are all very it's, it's kind of the mime style of humor a good mime style of humor where you're using exaggerated character reactions and facial expressions to get the humor across without having to have Johnny Depp go um or a Johnny Depp sound alike in your Lego Pirates of the Caribbean going Oh why is Rum gone? You can just have him go you could just have Johnny Depp's character you can have uh, Captain Jack Sparrow or Lego Captain Jack Sparrow holding a fake grog rum jug, trying to drink it and go toss it over his shoulder and go oh, Because the rum's gone. That would be fine. Um work just as well, but we we don't get that, which is unfortunate. 
I think the voice acting could kind of hurt that. We'll see how this goes. Um, Ubisoft shows up, comes out to demonstrate Just Dance 4, and once again we are subjected to moves like Jagger. Can they pick something else? Anything. Please. I mean, they, they probably already pissed off Taz in the Shadows enough that, that, that he has, that he gives them their to his eternal ire. Um, I don't know. On the other hand, maybe when Pax comes around, Pax Seattle comes around, if, if Todd in the Shadows makes it, maybe we'll get to see him dancing to moves like Jagger in some sort of that guy with the glasses feature thing, and we'll get to mock him. I don't know. Time will tell. Um, there's that. Another look at gameplay of Zombie U. It looks like inventory management doesn't pause the game, which is one of the things I was kind of pointing out earlier when I was talking about Skyrim. Um, which works for a horror game because it means that you will have to be kind of always keeping an eye on things. They have this weird zombie scanner or something scanner feature, but it doesn't look like it's very effective. Um, so I'm not sure what the point of that is. It involves holding up the Wii U t towards the screen and then moving back and forth. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how it works or if it will work. Anyway. And then we get their minigame collection, Nintendo Land, which basically takes up like the last five, ten minutes of the presentation. Um, aside from new, Mar new Super Mario Brothers U, we have no upcoming announcements of Zelda games, no Metroid, though admittedly considering how other M turned out, maybe that's for the best. Um, no Animal Crossing, nothing like that, which is disappointing. Um, I would have liked to have seen some of the, seen what they do with that, or if Natsume was working on a uh, Harvest, Moon game, Harvest Moon game for the Wii U, to see how that would turn out. It's just something to give the idea of, of, okay, we have our main, mainstream AAA game titles in terms of, of, like, your, your, your zombie action games, and your brawlers, and your Lego games. One of the things that Nintendo consoles have always been good at is having something weird and eccentric but fun, like Animal Crossing. And we're not getting any of that here. Um, unless we've gotten some of that. So we go from the Nintendo press briefing to the 3DS press briefing. Let me take a quick pause for a moment while I change pages. And we're back. Um... So, we start off with Reggie on this one again. Um, he kind of flubs his line to start. This presentation actually kind of feels a bit like amateur hour, because we hand off to the guy from the earlier presentation. I'm going to flip back a couple of pages, see if I can get it. See if I wrote down the guy's name. No, I did not. I have no idea who the hell this guy is who's who running this presentation. It is just some guy. Apparently, he hosted a de stage demo of Mario Kart 7 a while back and beat Reggie at it. And so, Reggie's shuffled him off to his own, to an on internet only presentation as punishment. I don't know. Because, I mean, from near as I can tell, nobody knew this thing was coming before we got the, to the Nintendo press conference. Um, this place got a smaller venue. Um, I don't know. It was a more intimate venue, but that basically all it really meant was that Reggie could heckle the press conference from the front row, which shows how much respect this schmuck is getting. It also makes me wonder how much respect... gives us this vague sense of burying the 3DS after it's, uh, after it's finally started catching its stride. Wow, Nintendo, stay classy. Also, it shows how much respect Nintendo's giving the people who are bothering to come watch this. Yeah, we're giving you this, asshole. Have fun. <sighs> um, so... We get, um, first look of Castlevania Lords of Shadow, The Mirror of Fate for the 3DS. This is set between Lords of Shadow 1 and 2. 
And it looks fun. It looks really good. Basically, what this does is it bridges the gap between the two and starts bringing in much more of what we consider the broader Castlevania mythology in here. I mean, Castlevania Lords of Shadow is a reboot, and this continues with that. But I guess you could call Lords of Shadow the ultimate Castlevania universe in the same way that Marvel had their ultimate universe, where it ditches all this extra continuity and takes things back to the beginning while still having little hints and nods in there for the fans of the other Castlevania characters, or of the Marvel, Marvel characters, the Ultimate Universe, and other Castlevania characters here. Um, as an example, the second to last boss in Lords of Shadow was not dr was Death, who in the Castlevania games is the, or potentially your second to last boss. The other game also included little nods to lots of the Marvel, mo Marvel but the... Uh, Universal Monsters, who were the original antagonists of the early Castlevania games. You had the Wolfman, you had a Frankenstein monster thing, all this other sorts of stuff. And it looked great. Um, and they were interesting to fight. And they were the great boss encounters. And I, I loved Castlevania Lords of Shadow. It's a game which I rented, and honestly, I should probably buy a copy of it because I want to go through and play the DLC stuff. And play more of that because I like that game. And Mirror of Fate kicks in basically a generation later with Gabriel's son, who got left behind, um, Trevor Belmont. If you're familiar with the Castlevania series, you'll know that Trevor is the son of Sim is, is the father of Simon, who also shows up here, and is the main character of Castlevania Three, which is considered to be one of the best Castlevania games. Um, and this has Trevor going out to take on Dracula, which adds a whole new love layer of things, because if you've played Castlevania Lords of Shadow all the way through, it's been out long enough that I feel, don't feel bad about spoiling this, because it's an important part of the mythos now. You'll know that Gabriel Belmont, the main character of Castlevania Lords of Shadow, is now Dracula. And thus this puts a whole new spin on things, in a lot of fun narrative ways, because I mean, Alucard is in this game. And it appears to be in Castlevania Lords of Shadow, as I mentioned earlier. So, Alucard is the son of Dracula. And they make clear this that they're keeping that as the fact. Alucard is Dracula's son. So, this now means that, Trev that aside from when the main Castlevania universe, where Alucard is the longtime ally of the Belmont family, here, they are related. It, in the old Castlevania universe, if you had Drac if you had Alucard show up and you had at the Belmont house, the kid might call him Uncle Alucard as, or Uncle Al or whatever as a might do as a tongue in cheek thing if the writer's trying to be cute. But now well, Alucard is literally Simon's uncle. This I, I hope they do something with this. There's potential here. This, this could be good, fun writing. And hey, um, Mercury Steam is good. Did a decent job with the story for the first game. I hope they do something with this here. I know Japanese developers would be all over the family aspect here, because just because of Japanese cultural things with family. Um, I hope they do something fun with this here. I, I'm pumped. I am really pumped. This makes me want to get a 3DS. I, I've always kind of waited when getting a, a console. Of a, a, a uh, Nintendo handheld for the past couple of generations until after Castlevania comes out. So, Castlevania is coming out. So I'm guess I better start saving up because it looks like it's going to be a fun, good game. Um, we see some enemies. Talk about the secondary weapons. They've changed how the boomerang works. Normally in these games, the boomerang it goes out, hits a target, comes back. For looking for the 2D games, depending on how you do it, it goes out, hits the enemy, hits him again on the way back. So it gives you a real two. A two hit opportunity here. Um, possibly two hits on multiple enemies depending on how you use it. Here it hits, stays, and just spins for a bit before coming back to you. Sort of the way the. Um, I'm, I'm playing uh, Darksiders right now and I'll be reviewing that once I've, done beat, once I've beaten it. But it reminds me how the um, boomerang 
works in Dark Side. Where it goes up, sticks, hits the enemy, spins for a bit, and comes back. Uh, here's some enemies, various sizes. We have lots of versions of the classic Castlevania enemies in sort of a new form here, as far as like the, the ghost knights and the skeletons and that sort of thing. Um, so that's good. It also uses more Metroid style uh, explore, Metroidvania style explore, exploration, which is you know, also good to have. The best Castlevania games have always included that in some fashion. Whether it's like the multiple routes from Castlevania 3, and even Castlevania 2, when they went kind of RPG-ish, well, it had poorly hidden secrets and a lot of guy damn it moments. Um, I think that they handled it very well. So I look forward to seeing how this turns out in um, in uh, that in uh, th it's Castlevania game in the uh, Lords of Shower in Mirror of Fate. Um, but yeah, I, I look forward to seeing how this builds the Castlevania this new Castlevania mythos. I'm interested in seeing how the story turn how this progresses the story because I liked the story in Lords of Shadow. I like the level design, like the atmospherics. It's a good time to be a Castlevania fan, is what I'm trying to say. Um, we see the same Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon trailer again. Um, nothing new there. We have a demo of Disney's M Epic Mickey Power of Illusion, presented by the game's two main lead designers, Peter Ong and Warren Spector. Basically, this is a spiritual successor to Disney Castle of Illusion. Mickey Mouse's Castle of Illusion, which was an older game, which I unfortunately haven't played. I need to hunt down a copy of it so I can give it a try. Um, it looks interesting. It looks like it combines the gameplay for, instead of expanding the earlier Disney games with uh, the paint thinner gameplay aspects of um, Epic Mickey. Um, it also looks like they're using the, the video game concept to bring in more Disney characters in here, ones who haven't entered the wasteland yet, in terms of who aren't, for lack of a better term, faded from, and depreciated from Disney canon. Um, it, it's weird though they have the bad guy be, villain being Maleficent here, in terms of having her trying to escape the wasteland, because, well, Maleficent only appeared... As a main antagonist in one movie, Disney has recognized that she is perhaps one of the most villainous villains in their entire repertoire, as as evil, if not more evil, than Corella Deville, and sh who wanted to murder puppies. And I mean, they recognize that, that she's she's the Disney villain who turned into a dragon. So. And particularly with, with how they built her up as the antagonist of the, like the Kingdom Heart game, Kingdom Hearts games as well. I and mean, she is the most evil character Disney has ever created, and they recognize this. I don't know how they need to make stick her in the wasteland as like, oh, she's a depreciated character because like trying to escape exile, because it's a bit like I don't know. It's a bit like Darth Vader saying, no, people don't fear me anymore. You know, I mean, no, it's a bad example because there's a certain degree of villain decay caused by the prequels. But I mean, like Emperor Palpatine, Emperor Palpatine was didn't suffer villain decay in the prequels. Emperor Palpatine going, you know, I uh, you know, I'm not feared anymore. People don't get upset when I people aren't afraid of me and don't. Uh, when I do the force lightning and try to kill them, and they're like, oh, it's not that bad, like. What do I have to do to get a little respect out here? Murder a bunch of... Ch of j have a bunch of Jedi children murdered? I did that! I don't know. Maleficent... I mean... Maleficent is really Disney's most iconic villain with a face. I mean, technically, I mean, technically the only person who's more evil than her is the hunter who shot Bambi's mother. And he doesn't have a name or a face. So, anyway... Aside from this, from this little tongue-in-cheek nitpick, the game looks fun. Um, next is Paper Mario Sticker Star. Not sure what I think about this one. Paper Mario... The Mario RPG games, 
Paper Mario, the Square, um, Mario, uh, the uh, uh, Square Super Mario RPG, they're all interesting, and I enjoyed playing them. But this game does one thing as a major gameplay mechanic that makes me go, uh. Most RPGs, maybe the Mario ones, you level up, you earn new abilities, these are powered by some sort of ability point, which is a resource you have to manage. Um, here, your abilities are stickers. And the number of uses that you have of them are based on the stickers that you have that you take from the environment and that sort of thing. And the number of stickers you have available is determined by the size of your sticker book. It feels like having to buy individual spell castings. That's not necessarily a good thing. There should be a way to do this better. And I'm not sure... I mean, I, I, I like kind of the idea of doing the sticker thing. But there's got to be a better way to handle this. Um, I'm not quite sure what, though. We get a tra oh, we get a trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Dar Drop Distance. Get it? There's 3Ds in the title. We're not just putting the 3D in there because the game is in 3D. It actually means something with the title. Yeah, it's dumb. Um. Anyway, three new. Also, get we see th little sneak peeks of three new worlds from uh, Disney that are going to be in there that haven't appeared in previous games. We have Tron Legacy, with um, with both Flynn's in there, um, as well as Korra. We have um, Hunchback of Notre Dame with. Um, yep, all th those characters. And we have the Disney animated Three Musketeers with Mickey and Goofy and um, uh, Donald as the Musketeers. I forget what the fourth one was. Because uh, the thing with the Three Musketeers is there's actually... Is, if you remember the story, yes, there's there are Three Musketeers. Yes, the three musketeers, but there's technically four of them: Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan. And D'Artagnan doesn't. Oh, well, D'Artagnan! And D'Artagnan isn't a proper musketeer until basically the end of the book. And so, I presume here that the player will be serving in the D'Artagnan role. Um, it'd be interesting. I, I hope that that if they do this right, they find a way to have a. Um, the player and um, Brutally Sora ending up in a three-on-one against Mickey, Goofy, and, uh, and Donald, at least briefly. Just, or something like that, just to, just, uh, even if they don't actually fight, just to have that potential happen, just to continue, just to tie in with the uh, Three Musketeers story. Because, honestly, that's probably my, I say, not to say that's my favorite part of the Three Musketeers story, but I do love that bit in the beginning of no matter which version you're in, where basically D'Artagnan shows up in France and manages to piss everybody off. Everyone. Um, and he gets, gets three, duels on the, three duels on the same day. I, I love that bit, but anyway. Um, we see more Scribble Knots Unlimited stuff again. Uh, get a montage of upcoming titles. Nothing stands out. It kind of goes a little too fast for me to keep track of it. Um, we see some more new Super Mario Brothers two. No points total in this. It's all about it's all about the coins, baby. Um, and that's the main focus here. It, it's interesting. We'll see what turn. I have the hiccups. Pardon me. Interesting again. This is a case of. I don't have enough information now to judge. It's it sounds like you have to put that to win. You have to collect a million coins. And I'm not sure why. I mean, most of the game when you're collecting something, they give some basic, vague pretense of you have to get enough stars to complete the star road, 
Well, in order to get the final boss fight against Bowser, you need to get all of these star pieces, or whatever, to continue. Here, it's if it is okay, you got to get a million po million coins. What makes getting a million coins so important? Aside from the million, a million is a big number, and it's fun to say, or something, um, or something. Just, I like to have some reason for that. It wouldn't take long to take, like, oh, Bowser trashed Princess Peach's mansion, and she's tight for cash, so Mario and Luigi have to have to collect a million coins to pay for renovations. Something like that. Give me some, throw me a bone here, man. So, that is the Nintendo press conferences. I should, one thing I should mention, toss, as I toss this aside, these press conferences is one major sin that, I, that bears mentioning and stressing. They were boring. Say, oh yeah, it's a press briefing. Of course it's not. Of course it's gonna be boring and dull. But here's the thing. Ubisoft's press conference last year, for all of its faults, was not boring. Yes, during the press conference, I wanted to beat Mr. Caffeine to death with the nearest thing to hand. I hated Mr. Caffeine. This year, I found, um, whatever the hell his name was, the sellout internet personality guy, I found him obnoxious and I found the topless bit in the Ubisoft press conference awkward I thought EA came across seeming somewhat pathetic in their press briefing like hey guys see we're relevant and important but I never found the point I'm like I, I there, there are things that I'm doing that are more interesting than this and the only reason I'm still watching this is because I'm covering the damn thing. And I have to do a vlog. Net point never came along. Nintendo press conference. That bored me to tears. I can only imagine how tough it must be if you're sitting there in the audience going, I can't heckle. Look at the front row and like, I can't heckle this. I can't make fun of this while I'm here, because I'm trying to be professional, and I'm a, and I'm, I'm a real journalist, and I can't just make fun of this, because be, that would be bad, and it would, and it would be bad for my integrity. I, I'd hate to be that guy, in the front row going, this sucks so hard. I mean, maybe if you're watching it live, you have the advantage of you can, actually, yeah, when you're watching it live, you have the advantage of you can get the Twitter feed live going, going live the whole time, so you can sit there with the Twitter of basically the entire gaming press out there, you can look at this and go, yeah, yeah, this, this is stupid, isn't it? And someone will tweet back and go, yeah, this is really dumb. You can look at Tomb Raider demo and go, yeah, so uh, Laura Croft is Katniss now, and you go, and someone will respond and go, yeah, except with fire arrows, and more rape victimy, and all this other sorts of stuff. And with particularly with these two press briefings, uh, especially the, um, the, the which wasn't that actually even with the Nintendo one which I watched live, um, the first one on Twitter towards the end of this, basically these journalists were going, I can't make fun of this, just end. If anybody failed their press briefings at E3 this year, it was Nintendo. It wasn't Sony with their Wonder Book, which I thought, which I thought was a certifiable strong contender for the worst moment of an E3 press briefing. Nintendo managed to top that with a mini game collection. By the way, this mini game collection features Don featured Donkey Kong and Legend of Zelda ga mini games, and they didn't show them. So, I God. Um, hopefully, some more interesting stuff will come out of Nintendo um, press, uh, out of the Nintendo booth from coverage on GameTrailers.com. Next week, Wednesday, I will do my sold and unsold or my the top list of games from E3. 
One thing I want to mention before I get done, because I forgot to mention this yesterday about the Sony press conferences, is some notable absences from everybody's press briefings here. Um, from Sony, there was no The Last Guardian. Admittedly, this is to be expected now. They didn't show up last year either. And they've had problems with staff and stuff, and people getting fired, particularly major development people. But I can't help but wonder if this is looking bad for what could have been, like, if, if it made it out this year, one of the best games of the year, one of the most anticipated games of the year. Because if one would think if The Last Guardian was going to come out this year, we would be seeing it at E3, and we're not. TGS hasn't come yet. There's a distinct possibility that they're saving it for TGS. But we'll have to see. Um, no new Grand Theft Auto 4. The 4, Grand Theft Auto 5 stuff. Um, so nothing there. From any of the press conferences. It actually would have been nice if they were going to show Grand Theft Auto 5 stuff. It'd be kind of interesting if they showed it at the, at the Nintendo press conference just to show Grand Theft Auto 5 is coming to the Wii U. Because that would be interesting there, and again, Grand Theft Auto V is a game which would also do well by having your mini-map and stuff at the bottom screen. Or possibly even you, if you want to do the motion control um, Wii driving wheel thing, using the um, controller for the Wii U for driving. It'd be dumb and hokey, but it'd be interesting. Which is more than you can say for a lot of other stuff here. Uh... So we didn't see any Grand Theft Auto 5. Um, no discussion of Mass Effect DLC. No new stuff from Bioware outside from the uh, new stuff for the Old Republic. Um, and and that's the those are the big things that stuck out for absences. Um. Oh, that's a weird, that's a weird thing, but considering how they're playing up the uh, uh, Wii U as being for hardcore gamers, and, um, we didn't, there was no discussion of Call of Duty Black Ops 2 coming out for the Wii U. I mean, maybe it's too soon, maybe it's a case of it'll be coming out later, we'll have to see. And with that, I bid you adieu. Next week, I will have my picks of E3, depending on how on how things go. I may have a vlog post up on Saturday discussing Prometheus if I go see it if I go see it this weekend. So until next time, I'd like to thank you all for watching.